Hi, Christine. Thank you so much for coming on. I know it was a very short notice and I really do appreciate you being here, bringing all your mammalian expertise. So I'd like to start off by getting an understanding of, of what a mammal actually is. What, what are they and what defines them as a, a biological group? Well, as a group in general, it's a bit difficult. I mean, cetostoic mammals are in many ways quite different from the first two thirds of their radiation in the Mesozoic. Uh, what mammals sort of inherit from their very latest mammal like reptile, quote unquote, ancestors is um, some kind of fur or hair and also lactation producing milk. We have sort of indirect and somewhat direct evidence of both of those. But they were all very small. And what's interesting is that, you know, when you go from the latest Triassic into the Jurassic, it's not just mammals that make it through. It's a couple of other Cynodont lineages that are also very small. There's somehow the first thing about being a mammal is being very small, the size of a shrew or small. You know, and then there was an initial radiation in the Jurassic, but the, but the forms that are more ancestral to the modern groups in general don't really get going until the mid-Cretaceous. And so mammals are defined by a number of things. I mean, there's, they're sort of endothermic, um, or the first ones were not fully endothermic. Uh, they've got good smell, so it's a good sense of smell and good, and good hearing, but not particularly good vision. They don't have the kind of good color vision you see as a vertebrates. And then the Syrian mammals, the marsupials and placentals, have a number of innovations in the Cretaceous that sort of makes them become the dominant group. And they've got um, more complex teeth for food processing. They've got better hearing with external ears. Um, they're viviparous. They give birth to live young. But they're still small. So... Mammals, of course, most mammals today are still small. We forget that. We forget that the average mammal size is about is, is less than a kilogram, so uh, or the median size. So um, mammals were. I hate to use the word design because it has connotations, but you know that's a way of thinking of it. They were basically originally evolved to be a small critters scurrying around. Oh, the other thing that Syrian mammals have that makes them makes them cool, is they have um, modifications of the shoulder and the backbone, the ankle. They can do bounding locomotion, like you see a squirrel sort of bounding across the mm. room. Um, other kind of more, less, less advanced mammals are doing more kind of scurrying. Um, so um, they start the Cenozoic with a bunch of new features that were Good, but evolve for being small, and then they get to be bigger. And before the Cenozoic, the biggest mammals, and they're very rare, very, very rare big ones, are about the size of a badger or a corgi dog. Um, but they're just one-offs, basically. That, so mammals continue being successful at being small, but they also add larger ones at the start of the Cenozoic. So we have this giant world-changing impact event it, at the cretaceous paleogene boundary mm -hmm. the kpg the n cretaceous mass extinction so what were the inherent qualities of the mammals that ensured their survival and then how did they fare after that impact how did they diversify um was it just chance that they got through well, most things that survived the KPD extinctions were small. And if you're small, you can hide in crevices, you need absolutely less food, and you can also reproduce faster and repopulate. So um, basically, by that time, the less derived kinds of mammals are, are all extinct, apart from the ancestors of the, mon of the monotremes, the echidna and platypus in Australia. And... Um, so marsupials and placentals um, make it through with quite a few losses, but as do birds and lizards and other small things and frogs and stuff. So being small seems to be the key to surviving that extinction event. 
And then, of course, part of the reason why mammals, I think why the theory in mammals were successful in the Cretaceous and stayed successful afterwards, is that their evolution is very tightly tied into the evolution of antisperms or flowering plants. And the flowering plants make for a more kind of complex habitat. And they make their own micro habitat so it's sort of moist under the trees and stuff. And you have much more undergrowth. Think about the undergrowth you get in a sort of deciduous forest versus a pine tree forest. You've got a much more varied kind of habitat for a bunch of small herbivores, omnivores, and insectivores, which the guys, these guys were. Mm. So they're sort of set up to do well with the new world emerging in the Paleocene. And how much they're getting larger then is because the dinosaurs have disappeared, or how much it's because of the new kind of re-radiation of the flora, it's hard to know. So looking then at how they radiated after this extinction, uh, how quick was it? Uh, which were the key evolutionary traits or characters that evolved first? Well, you've got an initial radiation of animals called archaic mammals that are not in the main directly ancestral to today's, anything today. So you've got about 10 years worth during the Paleocene epoch of various sort of critters that all look a bit clunky. Um, but they did evolve into larger herbivores as well as carnivores. By larger, I'm not talking huge, I'm talking sort of sheep to pony size, not much bigger than that. There are a couple of things a bit bigger, but they're not the sort of full range of sizes seen today. And then the radiation of the more modern groups of mammals, the more modern orders, doesn't really get underway until the Eocene, about 10 million years later. And what happens at the boundary between the Paleocene and Eocene, the temperatures are rising Temperatures are fairly moderate in the Paleocene, and then they start rising at the end, and it's a big spike in temperature for the, um, oh. Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. Yeah, Paleocene Eocene Thermal, thank you. Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, P-E-T-M. And exactly if that's causal or not, it's not really known. But, and the temperatures then keep on rising for another five or six million years, and that's when you get the real origin of the modern groups of mammals, and the uh, more archaic forms then start, start to decline, and they're almost entirely gone by the end of the Eocene. So that's when you see the first primates, and the first hoof mammals, and the first bats, and the first whales, and things like that, and the first rodents, really, at that time. Some of them, a few of them are, are found in the latest Paleocene. Basically, they don't get going until the Eocene. So quite why the start of the Eocene is really the sort of the, the, the dawn of the mammal lineages that we have around today. I think it's not entirely clear, but that's what, that's what happened. Okay. Um, and then could we just have a look at some of the the most charismatic, the most interesting lineages throughout the Cenozoic? Which, which are some of, in your opinion, the most interesting groups that appeared? Well, the ones who are still the most diverse today, of course, are the rodents, which are mainly small, and the bats, which are mainly small. So we've still got, you know, the, product, the predominance of small mammals. Um, rodents have these fantastic incitus for gnawing, and then very efficient cheek teeth for chewing. And of course, bats can fly. Mm. So they are the dominant mammals today, even though we, they're not often featured in documentaries. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, I'm particularly interested in the evolution of the hoof mammals. The, um, so the odd-toed ones like the perissodactyls and the even-toed ones like the artidactyls. I mean, they're the ones who then get the complex teeth for writing up vegetation and uh, start to sort of really make an effect on the landscape with eating all the herbage and stuff. Um, the carnivores are, of course, very charismatic and modern. The order carnivora has these very specialized carnassial teeth for meat processing. And, well, primates, of course, the primates, after when it gets cooler in the, in the later Eocene, 
they get relegated to, to the tropics and don't really form part of the global fauna until much later, you know, with humans radiating. So primates are sort of interesting animals, but they're mainly tropical animals and they don't do so well worldwide when it gets cooler in the later you see. And uh, of course, the, the number of marine mammals are very successful. And uh, of course, marsupials have their own evolution in South America and Australia. And they're doing things, particularly in Australia, independent of anything to do with placentals. So, um, for example, you don't get big hopping placentals like the kangaroos. And exactly why that is, again, is a bit of a mystery. Oh, it's, it's interesting. There must be so much to look at in all of this. Why one group was successful, why another one wasn't, what kinds of ecologies work. It, there seems to be so much going on in there. Well, marsupials are interesting because people actually don't know that they were. They probably first evolved in Asia and they got over to North America, then down into South America and across to Australia by the start of the Eocene. But they also had a significant radiation in the early Cenozoic in North America. And they would have been like small possum-like things. That's all they were like then. But some of them got back over to the old world, back to Europe and Africa and Asia. I mean, they're very rare and uh, still pretty small and generalized. But they were basically extinct by the end of the Eocene. But then all other kinds of placentals went extinct then too. So I don't think that extinction can be blamed on there being marsupials. I think it was sort of bad luck at that point. Um, and, then they, and then, of course, marsupials are still very successful in South America today. What we don't have is the big carnivorous marsupials that we used to have until quite recently, uh, the sporacidons. Um, so that'd be like the Tasmanian tiger? Is that... No, no, like, like, oh. the, like the saber-tooth uh, tiger smilus. The Tasmanian right. tiger is, is, Sorry. In, is in Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's only really been in Australia that we've had a big radiation of herbivorous marsupials. And because the roles of big herbivores in South America was taken by the centrals, by the native ungulates who are now all extinct. Because most of South America's fauna, over, over 50% of the fauna today are immigrants from North America. So, um, so, you know, that's a whole pattern of formal exchange and some forms being successful one place and some the other place. And, you know, I mean, it's easy to sort of, well, it's not, one can make explanations for why things are the way they are, but that doesn't mean to say that, that those are true. You know what I mean? Yeah. It seems like such a complex tapestry of evolution. And even though, you know, like we in this in the scope of this documentary, we go back billions of years and we look at the uh, the Paleozoic and stuff like that. It feels very close. It feels very recent, all of this mammalian evolution to me. And like we should know so much. We should know pretty much everything about what happened. But there's it's just so complex. There's so much science in it. It's it's absolutely amazing. Well, a lot of the pattern of it is related to geography and continental breakup, or not continents yet, not yet being in their present positions. So you've got us, you've got marsupials isolated in Australia with a few a few potentials like, like bats. You've got um, a unique fauna in South America, but it's now not so unique. But that's just after the formation of the Isthmus of Panama when. Uh, you get migration of things from North America to South America. And of course, Africa was isolated until about 20 billion years ago. You had an endemic African fauna, which did include primates, but also a number of things, the Afrothes, like elephants and hyraxes and, and all kinds of little, you know, small things like elephant shrews and tenrecs and stuff. And the hyraxes, which are now just little small dasses of the, you know, um, known as the feeble folk in the Bible, they were a big radiation of much larger forms that then migrated out, you know, across Eurasia. And um, then almost, they're still alive today, but they're just a little sort of little rock 
little rock rabbit type things. They, 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 their big radiation has been lost entirely. So, yeah, interesting patterns that partly relate to continental movements and isolation and then radiation and, and colonization and then changing climate. You've had climate change throughout the Cenozoic. So we have very hot in the Middle Eocene. Then it declines and it have a big drop at the start of the Oligocene. Then it rises again in the Miocene. In fact, the, the mid-Miocene is probably the time with the greatest mammal diversity. And that's when you get grasslands spreading across the Northern Hemisphere and the big radiation of hoof mammals. You don't get grasslands in Africa until quite a bit later. And then the climate gets colder and drier in the late Marcy, and those northern savannah-like faunas all disappear. And then it gets really cold and dry. Then they start evolving in Africa. So a lot of the patterns you see can be tied into both climate change and continent movement. And of course, the continental movements are what's really relating to the climate change. So... Um, it's all basically related to where the continents are and how they're moving. Yeah, and we've seen so many times in in this documentary where something to do with the climate, something to do with the position of the continents has resulted in these huge uh, changes and the huge, huge impacts to entire ecosystems mm -hmm. and lineages of animals. But if we just look today, right, we've we've got all of these events that um, changed mammals, changed life on the planet. But we've eventually ended up with the animals that we have today, the mammals that we've got today. Um, which niches are they in? Are there still any that mammals haven't managed to expand into? And Equally, have there been any that mammals were in but have been lost from there? Well, of course, there are no legless mammals. So there are no, no sort of snake-like mammals. And I think that's because mammals have this backbone that moves up and down rather than side to side. So it's sort of hard to inchworm your way along if you're a snake rather than moving <laughs> side to side. Um, you don't have, you, you've got evolution of snake-like morphology numerous times in reptiles and amphibians, but never in mammals. Um, but that's not really a niche, it's a sort of kind of morphology, kind mm. of anatomy. Um, I can't think of any kind of, I mean, they've got fly mammals, they've got marine mammals. What else do you want? You know, I can't think of a, <laughs> of, of a niece there that somebody else is in that they're not in. You know, yeah, I'm, at, I'm struggling to think. They're good at being the Arctic. They're good at being the tropics. They're being endothermic makes them very flexible as to where they can live. I'm sure the audience in the comments will tell us an ecology or an environment that mammals can't <laughs> occupy. I'm sure they will, but, you know, I don't... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe there is one I haven't thought of. You know, but I, but I also, I mean, you you'd asked before about you know whether or not how important mammals are to ecosystems, and of course, ecosystems are still basically governed by invertebrates. You know, if all the mammals disappeared, would it be a disaster for the planet? And you probably get some of the grasslands, you know, turning back to forest because there wouldn't be things to graze the grasses, but. It's mainly insects and other invertebrates that are running the whole show. You know that. You know what? I'm really surprised at that answer. Um, and I was speaking to Anjan Buller about um, birds, and he said exactly the same thing. Uh -huh. that, you know, they're, they're not that important. It's, mm -hmm. it's everything else that's important. And mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, really surprised to hear it about mammals as well, and and I completely agree as a invertebrate worker. Well, I mean, who's who's doing the most eating of the plant? It's the insects, you know. So most of the plant defences are against insects, and they happen to be against mammals too. But you know that, that that's a secondary thing. So, um, and then if you didn't have you know things like earthworms, you'd have no soil, you know. So I mean. <laughs> the big animals we see today, the birds and mammals and co, I mean, they're sort of icing on the cake of biodiversity. Right. And if, if you took them off, you get some small changes, but maybe not immense ones. 
But for something like the uh, the Mammoth Steps, that's that's an ecosystem that revolves around the presence of a mammoth. Surely something like that is important. Are there any? Are, are there no ecosystems like that today? Like the perhaps the savanna in like Africa? I, said, or... I think if you took away the, the big grazing mammals and things like elephants aren't really true grazers, you get a lot more grasslands going back to more wooded conditions, maybe. But you still got vast expanses of prairie in North America and not a lot of, you know, they saw all the bison, but then what happened? Not much, you know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I think the vegetation would get um, somewhat more wooded, I think. You know, the grasslands would get somewhat more bushy and wooded and revert back to forest. But that would be, I think, the main effect I can think of. I don't know, that's thinking of the large mammals. Now, how big a role do things like rodents and other small mammals play in maintaining the ecosystem? Plant, plant seed dispersal. Mammals are really important for plant seed dispersal. So that could affect things. But that's more the smaller mammals. Okay. Well, let's uh, all be thankful for rodents and yeah, other tiny bats mammals. Too. Bats are important, yes. Yeah. So I mean, bats indeed. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, I think dispersal of seeds and that kind of stuff is more rodents and bats than it is big mammals. That could be it. That could be more of an issue. It could have more of an effect on the flora and the ecosystems than the loss of the big mammals. Okay, so just to end on then, we're going to fast forward a bit. Uh, episode eight, the last episode, looks at the sixth mass extinction. It uh -huh. looks at potentially like what the, the loss of humans from the planet would be. Do you think that mammals are in a, a decent position to survive what's happening to the planet? And if we were to lose humans, we were to lose a lot of the biodiversity of mammals, would everything still go on okay? Goodness, you need to talk to Dougal Dixon, not me. Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, if you lost humans, I think initially it'd be very good for the planet. Um, mm. But the things that are going to cause human loss are going to cause all other kinds of problems too. So, um, yeah, big mammals with slow reproductive turnover are going to be in trouble. Yeah. Smaller ones, less so. So would the smaller ones repopulate and evolve to be larger? Maybe. Um, yes. I mean, most of the biodiversity today is in, is in domestic mammals, isn't it? You know, so I mean, they, they'd all go. But how much... I, I don't know enough about what's predicted to happen to the ecosystems. Yeah. Um, and I don't think anyone would know exactly. The immediate loss of humans would be a good thing, except for all those poor cows. <laughs> Did you say cows or cats? Cows. Well, cows, dogs, cats, horses, all these animals, you know, they wouldn't do too well if all the humans disappeared. But, oh. um, but you know... The rats who are currently invading my house would do just great, you know? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very happy for those rats. I'm not. They're going to be dead <laughs> soon, unfortunately. I quite like rats, but they chew through the wire, so they have to go, you know? Yeah. Well, there can be a, a little localized extinction <laughs> in your place then. Uh, but Christine, thank you so much for coming on and talking us uh, through ma mammalian evolution. Well, I hope, is, there, is, there, is there any final question you have you want to, you want to ask? Or? Uh, is there anything you want to talk about? I'll put it back to you. Oh, goodness. Um, the, the main thing I want to say is that mammals evolved to be small, and most mammals are still small. But the big mammals we see around today are sort of jerry-rigged to be bigger. But then that's also true of everything, anything. Dinosaurs started off small. So making things bigger isn't always as easy as you might think it is. Um, but the basic mammal design is for a small critter. So it's partly probably why rodents and bats are so successful, because they're small. 
in the main. So the bigger mammals today are, are things that are um, taking a design that wasn't really meant for them, doing okay with it. But they're very, compared to small animals, they're very stiff-legged, stiff-backed, this kind of stuff, you know, ungulates in particular. Um, and, uh, they're, I mean, they're, they're doing fine with it, but that wasn't what they were actually made to do. Like, I think that that's a point to make, you know? Okay, well, Christine, thank you so much for dropping in. Very short notice. I've uh-huh. enjoyed hearing <laughs> all about these mammals and enjoyed it quite a lot. Okay, very good. Bye, Dave.